Thanks, Jason. It's really great to be here. And the mention of the teen people, 20 teens will change the world, is always making me feel old now because I'm far beyond those years. But the, uh, the funny thing about that award was it was actually, I was the only one that wasn't from the United States to win the award. So I was representing the whole world, I guess, for teen people. And it was along with others like Beyonce and uh, you know, football players and athletes in the US. And it really made me think and reflect on how I was going to change the world. But back to the beginning, I wanted to start by just sharing a little bit of context with you. This is a photo from Christmas 1984 with me at the Commodore 64, which my parents had just bought. Any Commodore 64 families here? <laughs> Still a few around. I wish I had mine. My mom lent it to my first sister, and then it disappeared. But you know, back then, I was one of only a few students in my class with a computer. But it really kicked off, I think, uh, a whole lifetime of curiosity and creativity for me. And today, I have a 16-month-old who, you know, no big clunking box. I think that my MacBook Air weighs a fraction of what just the hard disk or the floppy disk drive did for the Commodore. But you know, we don't give him that much screen time, but when mom or dad are traveling, he gets to FaceTime us, and he, loved, you know, he loves pressing those keys, and he's already figured out how to swipe on the iPad. I'm sure you've seen some of the videos of that. So this generation is definitely growing up digital. And a, a mentor of mine and a close friend for many years was Don Tapscott, who back in 1997 wrote a book called Growing Up Digital. I helped him build the website for it, and he invited me to my first speaking engagement, which was actually at the launch of his book. And I remember being kind of nervous with my written notes in front of this group of business people talking about this little website I had started with some friends. And much later, just a few years ago, we worked with him on his new book, Grown Up Digital, How the Net Generation is Changing the World. And Don became a mentor for me because after a few years of you know, learning how to program basic on the Commodore 64 and getting a phone line for Christmas and opening up my own bulletin board system with my modem and sharing files with my friends, I discovered the World Wide Web through a friend's dad who made the mistake of giving us his Visa card, along with one of those AOL CDs that came in the mail. He had a small business and he said, maybe you kids can figure out a way to promote my business on this web thing I'm hearing so much about. Well, we didn't exactly do that, but we discovered this amazing world of people who were creating websites and solving problems and teaching each other web design. And I read about this company started by a couple of students down in California called Yahoo. And this idea they had put up about selling advertising to people on a web page. And I remember in grade eight media class, talking to my teacher about it, and I think she thought I was crazy. No one really understood all these computers being connected. We had to drag this phone line from the guidance office to connect to the internet. It all seemed very strange. But my friends and I thought, well, if these students in California can do it, we can too. And we launched our own website. It was initially called the Internet Exposed, and it then became known as MyDesktop.com. And by 1999, it grew to one of the largest websites about computers and technology. Uh, over a million people a month read millions of pages of articles more than the circulation of any other computer magazine. And I think one of the reasons why it was so successful was because it was easy to read and understand. We were all still taking English class in high school, and so our writing wasn't very complicated. Um, and we had some of the world's largest technology companies advertising. Microsoft, HP, they had no idea that we were just a bunch of students. That was the amazing thing about it. My parents, I think, uh, started to think I was committing credit card fraud because every day the UPS or FedEx truck would come to the house with free things. Free monitors, free software. They, had no, they didn't believe it was real. But these companies had no idea I was just a grade eight or nine student writing them emails. I paid attention to grammar class, and so that worked for me. And in fact, I know a lot of people say that this whole new age of texting and communicating informally is, is hurting you know, writing. But there was a great article by Clive Thompson in the Global Mail just yesterday looking at the fact that young people today are writing much more than they were before. And especially when the writing is connected to a real world issue or problem. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that. that they're actually writing on average 40% longer. Um, so I think in many ways this, this global audience they're having is giving them more motivation to write and be literate. So with my desktop we ended up making a difficult decision to sell the site to a company down in New York City because for some reason none of the investors would take us seriously. I was in grade 11 getting co-op credits for working on my website a day and a half, a day, half a day every two days in my high school. And my friend from Australia who was my business partner had come to Canada without a work. We didn't know anything about work visas or immigration or incorporating businesses. So we ended up getting to work with the Prime Minister's Task Force on Youth Entrepreneurship and helping to create more supporting structures for young innovators and entrepreneurs. But we ended up selling the company. The timing was great. It wasn't for $100 million like Bruce, but you know, it was a few million dollars split between a few of us, enough that we were on the front page of the Globe and Mail and Oprah called. I had no idea how many people actually watched Oprah. I think I would have been terrified going on the show if I did, but apparently a lot of young people around the world do. And after the Oprah experience and after being in Teen People, I started getting a lot of emails from young people all over the world, countries I hadn't even heard of, asking me for mentorship, advice, venture capital. A lot of them had ideas and didn't really know what to do next. And I reflected on how lucky I was to have the support of my parents, my family, my principal and guidance counselor who gave me some extra credit for the work I was doing outside of school, and the fact that there were all these young people around the world that didn't have those support networks. 
So along with a friend uh, named Jennifer, who actually was uh, running a program funded by IBM called Girls Are It, Girls Are IT. Uh, and she was using social issues as a way to teach young women uh, web, pro web design and programming skills. And so we were kind of brainstorming about how I was going to respond to these thousands of emails. And she was reflecting on the fact that social issues were becoming a really uh, interesting way to engage young people in building these new digital media skills. We thought, what if we created a nonprofit, an organization that would be a global network that would connect all these young people together, so I didn't have to mentor them, but they could collaborate and work with each other, but really with the broad mission of trying to empower young people to understand and act on the world's greatest problems. And so that's where taking a global the organization I built uh, came from. And so far to date, uh, we've reached over 40 million young people in 13 languages with our programs. Uh, about six years ago, we launched an education program in particular. And we've, uh, we've recruited now over 4,000 schools in over 100 countries that have signed up to really collaborate, to get their students to use technology to collaborate on solving global problems. And that's a bit more of what I'll talk about, but not just about our programs, about kind of the broader context. And that's where I think the biggest challenge comes in, which is engagement. In the United States, uh, Pearson did a study of over 50,000 high school students, and on average, they said 46% of them said they were bored. And you might think this is a brand new problem, you know, the advent of the internet has caused this. But the US government, back in 1983, right when the Commodore 64 came out, introduced a study called Students in Today's Schools, where they asked graduating grade 12 students three questions. Did you find your schoolwork meaningful? Did you think your courses were interesting? And do you think what you learned in school would be important later in life? And these were the students that didn't drop out. Almost a third of students in the US do, luckily. In Canada, numbers are quite a bit better. But you know, the numbers weren't go aren't going in a great direction. They actually discontinued the study after 2000. But the, um, <laughs> the Pearson numbers give us a bit of a look at that. And so this really shows the disconnect. And you might think, well, this is the US. How about Canada? Uh, the Canadian Education Association in 2011 and 2012 did a similar study called What Did You Do in School Today? Looking at different forms of engagement. And you can see in grade five, 82% of students on average across the country report being intellectually engaged and stimulated at school. Yet by grade 12, the number is only 45%. So there's a huge number of students being left behind and not being, I think, optimally engaged by what they're learning. And obviously, uh, schools like Ridley are, are you know, ahead of the curve and are adopting programs and resources like the IB and like Challenge 2020 and global service learning projects and collaborations. They're working to address that, but I think they're still, obviously we're all here because there's more to be done in innovating in the future. And so the gap that was pointed out in the kind of seminal report that was put out by the Partnership for 21st Century Skills, this is kind of the coalition of all the biggest technology-focused employers in the world. They pointed out in their study really that today's education system faces irrelevance unless we bridge what they call the gap between how students live and how they learn. And I think technology is one part of it, but more deeply I think there's three embedded gaps. Um, as Ian talked about in his presentation earlier, I think of one core gap is relevance. You know, how is uh, this, what students are learning in school actually connected to real challenges, real problems they can see in their communities, in their country, in the world? And how can they play a role in addressing those problems through their work? Um, authenticity. A great example of this is the Student News Action Network, which was actually started by Washington International School. And it was really to solve the problem of student journalists creating you know, writing that didn't go anywhere beyond their classroom. It's a global network of international and independent schools where student work and student journalism is published, and so students have a global audience for their writing, not just for their class. Uh, taking a global, we created in 2002 uh, what we call the Global Gallery because a student came up to us at a booth and said, well, your website's great. It's got information on organizations and all these resources, but what about artists like me? How can, I, how can artists share their work? And so we now have over 30,000 pieces of youth and student-created art and expression from over 100 different countries. We ran a contest a year and a half ago with the new Canadian Museum for Human Rights where a student from every province got selected to go to the groundbreaking of the museum and meet the Prime Minister, one student, refused to shake the Prime Minister's hand and create a bit of a media scuffle, but he got to be an activist in his own way. Uh, and they also got to, to meet the Queen who was there. So really connecting the digital world with the, with the physical world and making all of this work you know, mean something and become accessible to a global audience. And finally, access. Obviously, you know, obviously the base you know, laptop situation, we, I don't think we should be arguing or debating one-to-one, -one, and it's great that we have the investment here in laptops, but there's so many other technologies and tools like 3D printing and digital fabrication. And you know, For $99, you can get your entire DNA sequenced and uh, log onto a website where you can compare it against your family, your friends, see what diseases you're vulnerable to. Uh, it used to be $100,000, so now it's less than the price of a biotechnology textbook in university. The kind of technologies and tools we have access to are amazing. How are we integrating those into our classrooms? Not just, laptops are definitely the first step, but there's so much more. And so, uh, I just completed, over the last uh, two years, a master's degree in inclusive design at OCAD in Toronto. And my focus is really looking at technology and how technology could support uh, inclusion in education. 
Uh, but not just technology as a tool, but technology is viewed through the lens of values. And Bruce talked a lot about values as well. And so what I did is actually ran a global crowdsourcing process, right? Over 4,000 people give input on and reflect on how the three values of global citizenship, student voice, and environmental stewardship could drive student engagement, and more importantly, how that could be measured and showcased in a network of schools. Um, and so first with global citizenship, you know, why global citizenship? Why is that important? So only 74% of students say they wish, uh, sorry, 74% of students say they wish their classes had a more global approach, and only 54% say their teachers knew about global events and incorporated global perspectives. So obviously, there could be more done here. Some of the great examples of programs that are working to address this, the National Association of Independent Schools in the US runs a program called Challenge 2020. And Ian spoke about the book High Noon uh, that Jean-Francois Richard to, um, wrote a few years ago. Well, what Challenge 2020 does is it pairs international independent schools in North America with schools around the world in communities in many cases who are facing these challenges. And it pairs up one-to-one -one school and students team up on one of those 20 global issues and work on solving one of those problems. So it's a direct program where they're developing and fostering global citizenship and students are partnering to create problems, uh, create solutions to some of these major challenges like deforestation um, that were spoken about. On a more simple level, we've also designed a whole series of educational games trying to contribute to this uh, Games for Change movement. One of my favorite examples is a game called AET, uh, The Cost of Life, which is very similar to the, the popular game The Sims, except instead of choosing you know, what color your walls are and what kind of car you're going to drive, you have to try to help a family survive for four years in Haiti through growing seasons, through diseases, um, choosing who can go to school and how much that costs and what happens when they don't. It was actually designed in partnership with an NGO called Global Kids in New York, working with a group of uh, students in Brooklyn. And almost all, every time you play this game, the first time you play, it's almost certain that your family will die. And that doesn't happen in The Sims. You know? So it's, it's really trying to get students to reflect on you know, the challenges of life in some of these places. And obviously, you know, service learning trips are the best way to do this. But we're really trying to think of how we can make that experience and that learning um, scalable to students who may not have access to that. And the principles of global citizenship, community engagement, global learning, professional learning for teachers, school culture, and school partnerships. So for each one of these three values, we crowdsourced over 4,612 people's input from over 157 countries through kind of an online site called User Voice. We had about 20 different ideas for how these, things, these values could be measured. We had over 140 new ones submitted by teachers, students, parents, education stakeholders around the world. So we're trying to design, my, my, my kind of culminating project in my degree was to design a, a participatory process to actually create this, this certification and really reflect on what it means to be a teacher-friendly school. The second area is a student voice and students having uh, control or at least input into their learning. And there's two different studies that support this. Uh, control and autonomy was one of uh, the four key dimensions of student motivation, and that was a study done by the Center on Education Policy down at George Washington University. And second, the much older study, um, the Sloan study, showed that students' ability to feel secure, content, and in control of their learning was most influenced by the level of choice of their learning and the level of authenticity. So making sure that students are able to somehow direct and design their learning and, uh, and that it actually is authentic and has an impact is well supported. And we're not just working on improving and supporting student voice um, kind of in individual schools. We've also been involved uh, earlier this year in a conference called the Education World Forum, where we were sponsored by Cisco and we had students from 20 different countries video conferenced in using Cisco's high definition video conferencing and speak to over 100 ministers of education around the world on what they thought the future of education was. So looking at student voice in the classroom, at schools, and even on a macro level with policy around the world. But really thinking of how participatory processes like the one I shared and like what you're doing today, you know, there are students here and represented, that's a, that's a big step forward. And so again, there's five principles around student voice to maybe think about and reflect on. The learning environment, and what, what kind of voice students have in designing and developing learning environments. Uh, there's a primary school principal, a uh, friend of mine in Australia, every year repaints some of his classrooms based on input from the students. And they learn about learning styles, they learn about color theory, and then they get to choose the colors of their classrooms democratically. School culture, school policy, student leadership, and then student-centered learning. And finally, the third kind of value and these values are all kind of uniquely brought to life through technology. It's only because of technology that we could bring those students from around the world together to speak to those principals, uh, to those um, ministers of education. It's only through technology that we can collaborate through a program like Challenge 2020, but it's not about the technology, it's about what it brings to life. And that's the conversation we're trying to have and to shift. And so with environmental stewardship, there's similar data around you know, how environmental education in general can address a lot of issues in schools, can you know, improve absenteeism, can address um, you know, disengaged students, but also once people, if you use an environmental curriculum in any subject area, it actually makes people much more likely, statistically, I think there's a study over 10 or 15 years, 
50% more likely to take a number of environmentally friendly actions. So there's benefits there. Uh, and we've done a few things around the environment. We've launched a mobile app called Commit to Act that allows schools to compete. Uh, students can track their environmentally friendly actions and compete in a friendly way across classrooms with schools around the world. And on a much broader level, we've launched a program that was award, uh, won an award from the European Space Agency last year called Deforest Action. This was inspired by Richard's book. Uh, the students picked deforestation as the issue they wanted to address. We were able to get satellite data from a region of Borneo sponsored, which is normally tens of thousands of dollars a month. Each student gets a parcel of land and they monitor the weekly satellite data updates for evidence of illegal logging. Uh, more than half of the logging that goes on of deforestation in Borneo is illegal, but the communities just don't have the technology to keep up. So we're partnering up students around the world to actually help identify and track the illegal deforestation, and then those community groups and local NGOs on the ground are able to take action on it. And there's a whole new um, course for teachers, a free MOOC, uh, as I mentioned earlier, for teachers on how to adopt this program being sponsored by HP coming up. So looking at how we can look at the issues both very locally and in our school, but also globally. How can we monitor and support? And even with this program, it's not just monitoring the satellite data, it's understanding you know, why are those forests being destroyed? Well, for, in most cases, for palm oil. Well, how is palm oil used? Well, students in Australia discovered it's used in Tim Tams, which are their favorite cookies, or here in Kit Kats and Nutella. And then the students brought in their senators, they, they got a bill adopted in Parliament, they got the company to commit to using only sustainably sourced palm oil by 2015. A lot of other changes across many subject areas can happen when you look at an issue in these different ways. So again, the, the stewardship principles, connections to the community, health and well-being, interdisciplinary work, policies and practices, and of course, the outdoors. And so with all of this as a kind of result of this, this research and looking at um, technology through these different lenses as a driver of student engagement, we've actually launched just a few months ago at the ISTE conference, the International Society for Tech and Education, the second largest ed tech conference in the world. We had about 20,000 teachers there in San Antonio. We launched this as a formal program of taking it global where a school can actually be certified as a future-friendly school by demonstrating evidence that they engage in programs across these areas. And the most important thing about the program is that all of that evidence is transparent, is public, and is shared using a Creative Commons license, which means any other school can reuse, build on, learn from, and contribute to what each other's schools are doing. So we're really trying to put a vision forward for how technology can be used. Yes, it's all about technology, but how we can bring these values to life in a way that creates student engagement in, at levels we haven't seen before in solving real-world problems, both in their communities and in the world. And I wanted to close with a quote from my co-founder, Jen, that we shared for many years at the close of our presentations, was picked up a few years ago as part of a project Starbucks was doing. So we had many people learn about us from Starbucks, which is very interesting. And that question, I think, is what we're all wondering as we reflect on the future of Ridley and the future of education today, which is that we wonder if young people were actively engaged in all aspects of society and thought of themselves as community leaders, problem solvers, role models, mentors, and key stakeholders, how would the world change? Thank you.